again. All right, so now we'll get into some of the actual content uh, for the class. The overview. Um, this is just an overview of the topics we're going to be going through. There's some interesting ideas here, I think, for those of you that have done some estimation pre that hopefully will be worthwhile. Um, as we mentioned, as I mentioned in the uh, overview of the class, a lot of this is about given a sequence of observations. And again, this is you can think of this as a vector changing over time, a vector of measurements. Uh, the sensors on my shoes are a good example. At every sample, we're getting nine different measurements. And we get a sequence of measurements from, let's say, time zero, when I turn the devices on, all the way up to the current time. And so if you think about estimating what is the state at time n, uh, let's say time, um, time n minus 1, given that I've seen a sequence of measurements, multivariate measurements from time 0 all the way up until that time, this is a tremendous number of measurements, or at least it could be. I turn these devices on at 9 o'clock this morning, uh, and they're recording at 128 hertz, so if you think about what this set of data looks like, it's actually huge. And I want to estimate what the position of my foot is at you know, this instant of time, and, uh, and that actually could be influenced by what happened this morning. And in fact, in this case, it is. These are inertial sensors, and so the way that it estimates position is by essentially integrating the information from the accelerometers, integrating actually twice or three times if you count the gyros. And so where I'm, the estimate of where I'm located at this moment depends very much on where I was located at 9.05 this morning, five minutes after I turned it on. And so this accumulation of data actually affects the estimate of the state at this current time instant, even though that was buried from literally hours ago now. So, um, so all that is just to say that, that what we're trying to do in some applications is actually really, really quite hard and quite challenging. And you'd be hard-pressed in some instances to, to solve these problems using any other approach. Um, and we are asking for even more. Uh, being graduate students, uh, we care about things like optimality, not just giving me a good estimate, but give me the best possible estimate. And before we can talk about that, we, uh, I'm sorry, let me back up. we would also like to know, and how good is it? How much evidence do you have, or how much confidence do you have uh, that your estimate is, uh, is good? Over what range could the state actually be? Is it plus or minus 10 feet in terms of where I'm located, or is it plus or minus an inch? That matters a lot. We know our estimate could be uh, wrong, and we'd like to be able to answer uh, whether we know if our estimates are any good, and we'd like to be precise about what we mean by having a good estimate. What does it mean for an estimate to be good? So there's some underlying ideas that we've got to cover before we can actually start about creating an estimate. We have to have a, an idea of what a good... And so these slides are, are partly about that. All right, so first example. This is just a thought experiment. Um, suppose all we know about X is that it has a normal distribution and a mean of 3 uh, with a standard deviation of 0.2. If I asked all of you, and I'm, tempt I I'm tempted to ask you because I would like to have more interaction, but I also don't want to insult you with such a simple question, uh, but what is the best estimate of x, just given that information that I just gave you? And I've you know, plotted the distribution here. And I'm sure all of you, and, and including myself, this is not a trick question, would say, well, 3. 3 is the best estimate of x. If that's all you know is that it has this type of distribution. You know, it might not be at 3. It might be at 2.5, or it might be at 3.1. You know, it could be a, a number of different places. But the best estimate, by almost any measure, of what x is, given that information, your best estimate of x would be 3. Right? I, I, I don't think that's tricky. Um, but if I say, well, what do you mean uh, that is the best estimate? By what criterion are you saying it's best? Be, be, be more precise about that. The most, most probable. probable. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, that's one way uh, that you can define things. It's not the most common way, it turns out, but it's, it's a perfectly reasonable way. Um, but what is what we mean by best, how we define best, it's going to turn out varies depending on the application. Does anyone know of another criterion by which we say that 3 is the best? You said most probable. That's true. Uh, what else can we say? 
in terms of, in what other way is, is this the best estimate? You can look at the symmetry of, of the distribution mm -hmm. and say that it's in the center of the distribution. Somehow. Sure, good. And another way of measuring the center of the distribution, you say, well, the distribution is kind of a, a blob right here, and it's right in the middle. And one way of representing the middle is by saying, well, x is the mean of the distribution. That's a, an idea that I, I assume most of you are familiar with. And it turns out that the mean is best in the sense that it minimizes something called the mean squared error. So if you calculate the squared difference between x, where x really is, and what your estimate is, this estimate, on average, will minimize that error compared to all other estimates. So it's another way that you could find this. You could say, well, it's the most probable. True. It's the best in, in that sense. Uh, it's in the middle, uh, which is another way of saying it minimizes the mean squared error. You could also say, a, a third criterion, and I'll stop at three, but another criterion that you could use is you could say, well, it's also in the middle in the sense that half of the, there's equal probability that X will fall on the left side or the right side of that estimate. It's right in the middle in the sense that that there's equal probability uh, of, of x falling to either side of it. And, um, and the way that you can quantify that is you can say that it minimizes the expected mean absolute error rather than the mean squared error. So I, I bring these up. I'm not expecting you to retain all of these ideas just yet. But I bring these up because I want you to be very careful in this class whenever you use the word optimal or use the word best, I want you to be, be able to be precise in expressing what you mean by that. I, and I hope the other students in this room, when you present your work, either for the homework or for the project, will challenge you if you say this is optimal or this is the best, and you don't define what the criterion is by which you mean best. And let me give you some examples. In this case, those three different criteria we talked about generated the same estimate. It was the same in all cases. And when we think about a distribution, we usually think of the normal distribution because of something called the central limit theorem, which, which basically says that the normal distribution shows up naturally in a lot of different applications. There's a good reason for that. It need not be so. Um, it could be that I say, and, and rather than just having this be a contrived uh, probability distribution, let's say that, that we're going to get a measurement off of a die and when I roll the die, one of six faces will come up, and then I get a noisy measurement off of that face. So essentially, you roll the die, it shows up on a face, and then I add some Gaussian noise to that. And you end up with a multimodal distribution that looks like this. Now if I say, um, give me your best estimate of x. This is all we know, it's a die, and there's some noise added to it, and this is what the distribution looks like. And give me your best guess. Uh, now it becomes a little harder. I, I, I don't know what you would say uh, if I asked that question, because there's, if you said, well, let's just pick the most probable, we were talking about picking a peak in that case, and we've got six peaks that are identical height. Even if they were close, you'd be hard-pressed to really justify picking one over the other. If you picked the middle, like you'd suggested, if we picked the middle in this case, the middle is right here, and it lands at a very improbable value. If you say three and a half, well, three and a half isn't going to come up very often. Right? It has a good, it's a good measure on average. It minimizes the mean squared error still. It's optimal in the sense that it minimizes the mean squared error, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily a good estimate. Now, this example was made up, but the techniques that we're going to be using, um, particle filters, are really good at estimating uh, posterior distributions, and those distributions can be multimodal. It's an advantage they have over common filters and related techniques, is that they can represent multimodal distributions like this that are not in one dimension. In our case, we're going to be estimating a vector, and so in two dimensions, you can imagine this as like a topo map. It's almost like a landscape. We've got hills and valleys, and you're trying to find the peaks. You're trying to find the most probable value of x, maybe, uh, and in higher dimensions, it's harder to visualize, but it's a similar idea where there's valleys, there's, we call these minima oftentimes, there's maxima, and, uh, and you've got to think carefully about what you're trying to estimate. Are you trying to minimize the error on average? Are you trying to find the most probable value? Are you trying to make the error 
to the sort of the equivalent of the left and the right equally probable? Um, what exactly are you trying to estimate? It, it, you have to think carefully about that, especially with multimodal problems. Here's another example. In this case, I'm rolling an unfair die where the number six comes up more frequently. And, uh, you know, again, same question. Uh, if I say, well, what's your best estimate of X? It, that, I guess, in some respects is a trick question because what's best depends on how you define best. And, um, sorry, I thought I had a different slide following. So, um, unlike probability and statistics classes, where you start off with... Um, with definitions, properties of random variables and processes. We start off with a distribution, for example, um, and then you uh, derive other other related properties. In practical problems, um, you rarely know what the properties are in advance, and you've got to estimate them. And so, in this case, you're going instead of from distributions to data, you're going from data to distributions. You're trying to estimate properties from the data, and that's what we're going to be doing. Um, a great reference for this set of slides, and this will only be two lectures, but a great reference is a text by someone named Kay on estimation theory, and the citation is given at the end of the set of slides, which you have access to on the website. One of the key ideas when you're thinking about estimators is to recognize that your estimate itself is a random variable. Any function of a random variable is itself going to be a random variable. And in our case, we've got a very large sequence. This time I went 1 to n instead of 0 to n minus 1. But none, nonetheless, we have a sequence of measurements, all of which are corrupted by noise, which we usually model as additive noise. And, uh, and we're building an estimator that is a function out of this very large set of measurements. Again, if you think about the, the data coming out of these sensors, where I'm trying to estimate my position right now, you know, two and a half hours at 128 hertz after I started estimating it, um, there's a very a huge set of numbers in this set, and we're trying to estimate what the state is at, let's say, the current time, given all those measurements. And that estimator is a random variable itself. The estimator is a random variable. That's, a, that's an important idea. It's not a constant. It's not a scalar. It's not deterministic. It is itself a random variable. And a lot of what we're going to be thinking about is what is the distribution of the the estimator itself. And our goal is to get our estimator x hat to be as close, again you have to be precise in what you mean about close, but right now I'll be loose, to the true state as possible. My foot is in a given position right now and I want the estimate to be as close to the actual position as possible. Um, if my goal was to estimate um, estimate the mean from a set of measurements, and, and this sort of breaks down. My, my notation is a little bit off here. This is showing an estimate, that's what the hat denotes uh, on top of the variable. It simply indicates that it's an estimate. I'll use that notation throughout the class. Mu is often used to represent the mean. So if I'm trying to represent, trying to estimate the mean of a, uh, a random variable, and let's say the sequence of observations is not changing over time, I should not have used x hat here. Um, one natural estimator is to just use what's called the sample average. It's sort of the, the thing that comes to mind when you think about what's the most straightforward estimate um, to calculate, for example, the average of a random variable. Um, and similarly, if you're going to estimate the variance of a random variable that is stationary and isn't changing over time, uh, then you might use uh, this. This is another example of the, the obvious or natural estimator. And it turns out, that by certain criteria, this isn't the best, and, and even that isn't the best. It, it, again, depends on the criteria that you use. In this example here, 
uh, it turns out that to make it unbiased, you have to have 1 over n minus 1 uh, rather than 1 over n. So this is actually biased towards smaller values. Um, and you can go through and derive that and show that mathematically. And this is maybe a, a better distribution for thinking more carefully about what we mean by best. Um, this isn't multimodal, but now we've broken the symmetry so that it's got a heavy tail on the right-hand side, and it, uh, it has no support for negative numbers. It, it, it's for a random variable that can only be positive. And if we say, what's a good estimate of x? In this case, now you have to think more carefully again. It's not merely a matter of, of picking the most probable. You could do that uh, and pick the peak, uh, and that might be okay, but then... Um, Oftentimes, you're going to have values occur to the right of that estimate uh, more frequently than you will to the left. You could also minimize the mean squared error and pick the mean of the distribution, or you could pick the median uh, so that you've got half the probability on the left and half on the right. Um, again, it depends on your application and, and what criteria uh, is appropriate for what you're trying to estimate. Example, the right thing to do. Um, when we talk about uh, estimation theory, there's two key ideas, I and mean, we've already talked about some key ideas, but there's two key ideas uh, that you want to have a good handle on. One is what's called the bias of the estimator, which is the difference between the expected value of your estimator and, um, and the uh, parameter or the, the thing that you're trying to estimate. So in this case, I'm assuming that it's fixed if this were a random variable, it would be the expected value of it. Um, so this is the bias, is basically the average difference between what your estimator produces and what the thing is that you're trying to estimate. And an estimator is said to be unbiased if, on average, uh, the bias is equal to zero. And it does imply that the PDF of the estimator is centered at the, the true value uh, of what you're trying to estimate. And of the two examples of estimators I showed you on the earlier slide, the sample mean estimator was an unbiased estimator, but the estimator of variance, it turns out, and you can show, I won't drag you through the math right now, but it turns out that that's a biased estimator of variance. This slide here. So x hat is your, for every x you are, x hat is what you think it should be. The distribution of what you think it should be, is that right? I'm trying to understand what is e of x hat there versus just x hat. Well, x hat is a random variable, mm -hmm. and the expected value is what that random variable is across, say, many different data sets, across what's called the ensemble. So as you generate, and, and in our case, as we think about, well, what's the What's the uh, model to have in mind as we think about conducting an experiment? And the model to have in mind is that you generate a completely new recording in a parallel universe with different noise, but the same, um, same deterministic parameters. And if you have many, many parallel universes that are all conducting the same experiment but with different noise with the same statistical properties, and then you were able to average them all together, in the limit, as you have an infinite number of these universes, that's what the expected value would be. And we only get one shot, because we only get one data set at a given uh, time. You only get one recording of ocean data or whatever it is from a hydrophone. And, uh, and based on that, you generate an estimate. But the reason that we're talking about bias, even though we can never calculate this expectation, um, is because if we know the statistical model uh, that generated that estimate, then we may be able to get an idea of what the bias is, or, or more likely what the variance is. Any other questions so far? And then the second key property of estimators that we want to think about is the variance of the estimator. How variable is it? Um, and the variance of estimators is defined as the expected squared difference between your estimator and its expected value. So this is insensitive to bias, but it's a sense of how much does it vary. So I collect one data set today, I collect another data set tomorrow, and how much variability is there in the estimate of where my, my foot is if I was able to walk exactly the same trajectory is an example.
are both uh, the, the distribution for two different estimators. And they're trying to, they're, they're showing uh, what the distribution is. I've also plotted what the true value is that's trying to estimate in this case. So let's say that we happen to know it. I know where my foot is right now. And I, I then look at, over many recordings, how does the estimate fluctuate? This shows an example of an estimator that is biased. It's not centered on what the true value of the state is. Uh, but there isn't very much variability in estimate. It doesn't change that much from one recording to the next, is one way of thinking about that. Whereas this estimator is unbiased. It's centered at what the true value of the estimate is, but it's much more variable. So this one may say, well, your estimate of your position, if it was in one dimension, is at 7 feet plus or minus 2 feet, <coughs> which is biased but wrong. And this one says, well, your estimate is right on the money. It's at maybe 12 feet, but it's plus or minus 7 feet. So there's much more variance in this estimator. And oftentimes, and we'll see as we go through our techniques, there's a knob you can dial that will control a trade-off between variance of your estimator and the bias of your estimator. And so oftentimes you can trade one for the other, and there's often a sweet spot uh, that's sort of a, a very happy medium between two extremes of having very little variance but very high bias and, and vice versa. Any questions so far? Okay. I'm, uh, I, I'm not quite sure how to gauge this. I, I know some of you are starting to get saturated, but we've still got a lot of time left. I have a question, actually. Uh, Please. I think it's on the previous slide um, where you're just talking about... Seeing this pop up a lot. <laughs> um, all right. So we say... Um, if we could observe a very large ensemble, and we say, okay, we've got a ton of data from many different experiments under identical conditions, and we want to combine it all to calculate the best estimate that we can. Uh, how do we do that? And for a given distribution, it turns out there's lots of different ways of finding the most probable, which is what's called the mode, or the map estimate is the term we're going to be using a lot. Uh, this course, um, the arithmetic mean, the median, in which case you've got half on one side, half on the other side, and there are many other measures of where the middle is, essentially, for a given distribution function. And the question of which one do we pick has actually got to come from application, it turns out. Um, there are good reasons to pick all of these. These three are the most common and are the three that we're going to be talking about primarily this term, especially as we talk about particle filters. Um, and you should know uh, what they do and have a good reason for picking the one that you pick. The mean is the most common choice that you'll see in the signal processing literature, primarily because a lot of the signal processing literature is driven by linear techniques where you can calculate the mean in closed form. It's easy to compute. That's not usually a good reason to use it, but that's the primary reason why the mean is used so frequently in also statistics as well as signal processing. It does have the nice property that minimizes the mean squared error. So you say, in what sense is the mean optimal? You say, well, it minimizes the mean squared error. And then they say, and why do you care about the mean squared error? And you know, if you ask someone that out of the conference, they may hem and haw and not really have a great answer to it. Um, again, this has been widely used, but I would argue primarily because it's the most tractable mathematically, because you can usually compute it. And it's going to turn out with particle filters that it's not really any harder to calculate a median or a mode than it is a mean. And so then you can open that question back up, and you're not stuck with just using the mean because it's what you can calculate. You have other options now, and that's part of the reason we're having this discussion. A disadvantage, a reason not to use the mean, is that it is sensitive to outliers. If you have a distribution that is heavily tailed, where occasionally you get a, an extreme value, um, the mean will get kicked around by that, particularly if you've got a small sample. And so if you've got a distribution and you want to be, um, you want to be robust to sensors that occasionally give you just extreme values, the mean is a very poor choice uh, in that case, uh, because it is sensitive to outliers. The median, you say, well, why did you choose the median? In what sense is that optimal? And it turns out that the median minimizes the mean absolute error. 
and so it's a good choice, uh, in, in the, or it's optimal in that that's what it minimizes. Uh, again, it divides the PDF into two, two equal areas. So those uh, that are greater than X are just, or I'm sorry, the, the probability of the estimator being greater than X is equal to the probability of the estimator being less than X. Um, this can be difficult mathematically and computationally, but again, with some of the particle filter techniques, we'll see this isn't actually any harder to calculate than the mean. And a big advantage of this, you'll see this in, in some classes on robust statistical techniques or robust signal processing techniques, is that it's a lot less sensitive to outliers. Um, it doesn't tend to kick it around as much. The mode minimizes the most probable error. And, uh, and this selects the value that occurs the most frequently, which is a little weird to think about when you're thinking about a continuous distribution because the probability of any given value occurring is infinitesimal. But no, nonetheless, it's, it's at the peak of the distribution. And, uh, and this works well when you've got multimodal distributions. If what you care about is not being right on average, but being right this time, then you'd want to pick um, the mode, or what we'll call the maximum a posteriori estimator, the math estimator. Um, we had, uh, in the news, they had that mega lottery recently, right? Where it was like 650 million at stake, I think. And uh, if you had some kind of crystal ball that gave you a noisy estimator of what the winning lottery tickets were, and it had the analogous distribution, um, I would pick the mode. I wouldn't want the mean or the mean because I only get to use it once. And if you only get to use it once, and this is true in a lot of signal processing applications. If you only get to use it once, I want to place the best possible bet I can. For one, that would be the mode. It may be way off base. It may not be accurate on average. Uh, but it's going to give you the most probable value. And for some applications, you, you know, that's completely justifiable. Um, this is often difficult mathematically and computationally. Uh, and again, it may be wildly inaccurate. Um, but um, it's the most frequent value, and in some applications, I, I, I think it's a good choice. Uh, for um, hidden markup models that are used for taking a speech recording, for example, and figuring out what the sequence of words were that were said, um, they use, they essentially use this. They say, what's the most probable sentence that was just spoken? rather than trying to minimize some measure of median or mean or something like that. And there's a very slick algorithm that we're going to be talking about in this class that they use to figure out what is that most probable sentence. And there's an analogous idea for particle filters that we're going to be talking about. You have to know, understand what it is. So coming back to our uh, unfair die example, you roll the die and you say, well, what, what's best? If you chose the mode, you end up picking six it is the most probable value. If you pick the median, well, half the area, it, you know, there's equal probability of getting a value less than six as there is at picking six. So you end up right here, which is at a very improbable value. But if you're going to be doing this multiple times, it may not be a bad choice. And you're not that far from what the true value is. You know, I mean, you're pretty close to six. So if you're being penalized, uh, if you're not right on the money, then you wouldn't want to use it. But if you're being penalized only less, if you're, if you're off less far, you know, if you get sort of partial credit, then you would be well justified, I think, in picking the median. If they um, gave out, if they awarded lottery funds based on being close to the winning sequence <laughs> of numbers, then that might be a good choice. But they don't. They only give the winner, so I would pick the green. Um, and then the mean, if what you care about is mean squared error for some reason, then the mean is there. Again, it's at a very improbable value, uh, but it does minimize the mean squared error. So if that makes sense in your particular application, then that's where it would land in that example. Any questions or discussion about that? All right. State space tracking methods are uh, beautiful in part because they allow us as engineers to incorporate what we know about what we're trying to estimate. Um, this isn't true. Uh, some people are philosophically and vehemently opposed to doing this. 
uh, because if you say um, I'm going to rule that die and uh, and I know uh, that the table is rigged and that it's not fair and that there's no chance that that die can take on a value of one um, then you should change your estimator based on that knowledge and what one school of thought would say is say, no, watch the die roll across the table a million times. It can land on one of six faces, and maybe estimate the probability that it can land on each face based on that data, rather than based on your knowledge that there's a magnet in the table. We haven't taken any measurements, but it's just prior knowledge that you have beforehand. The techniques we're using allow us to express our prior knowledge about the state that we're trying to estimate, um, through one of those two mathematical models that, that we showed earlier, as well as based on the relationship of the measurements um, to the variables. This body of techniques we're using that allows us to express that, that prior knowledge is called Bayesian estimation. And although the state space um, techniques, the optimal state estimation, is often not taught from the standpoint of this is, we're using a Bayesian approach to estimating, um, it, it's what we're doing, and I think thinking of it this way really gives you a lot of insight <clears throat> and helps you tune the model more appropriately. It's helped us a lot within my lab in, in debugging some of the problems that we've had over the years. So, um, so I think this is worth thinking about, and I'm going to be teaching it from the standpoint of uh, we're using a, a Bayesian con context, we're using a Bayesian approach, we're incorporating prior knowledge, and I'll show you, give you a nice example of why that's so helpful. Um, one thing that's nice about it is if you don't have it, you don't have to use it. It's fairly easy, uh, even within the state space techniques that we're using, to say, um, ignore the prior knowledge that I have, or I don't have any prior knowledge I don't know, just use the data to tell me what your best estimate of the state is. In order to use um, this technique, this Bayesian approach, instead of thinking of x, the thing we're trying to estimate, as a fixed but unknown number, we have to switch and think about x as being a random variable. So the thing we're trying to estimate, the way that we treat it, the way I introduced it an hour or so ago, is that x itself is a random variable. The thing we're trying to estimate is a random variable. Um, classical estimation techniques treat x as something that's unknown, but it's a fixed number, it's not random, it doesn't fluctuate. And in this class, the thing we're trying to estimate is itself a random number. And the way we're going to express our prior knowledge is essentially through um, thinking a lot about the prior PDF, sometimes we'll, we'll calculate this from a, a statistical model that we have, um, but we think a lot about expressing the prior knowledge as X. So if I say, I roll the die across the table, and I, you know, all the sides are equally likely, but it can't land on face one, or with face one up, then I would say, I would model that as the PDF is equal to zero, uh, when x is equal to 1, and it's equal to 1 fifth for the other five faces. And as long as the prior knowledge we have is accurate, then you can improve the accuracy with that information. Uh, and the reason a lot of sort of the classic st uh, statisticians are opposed to this is they say, well, if your prior knowledge is inaccurate, you're actually going to make things worse. And there's a debate, and the Bayesians say, well, you know, these classical approaches, you're just assuming everything is equally likely, and you know, there's this implicit prior that you're using, and there's this debate that goes back and forth. But it doesn't matter, because we're going to use a Bayesian approach. The thing we're estimating, we're going to treat as a random variable, and we need to think about the prior knowledge that we have about it. Um, and this is useful in a lot of applications. It's relations. Um, often, in an engineering context, the knowledge that we have is that, for example, that a random variable is constrained to be within a certain range. If we're talking about um, Gaussian noise that's being added to our measurements, then, uh, then oftentimes we'll, we'll, a Gaussian has infinite support, and it can, ranges from negative infinity to positive infinity, but if we're putting it through an A to D converter that has rails and has limits, then the thing that we actually measure has a, is, is only, um, can only exist over a certain range. Um, we may also know that it's close to certain values. Um, most frequently, I would argue, especially for the applications we're talking about in this class, 
or we're talking about things moving, whether it's a ship or my foot or my arm or almost anything you can think of, there's inertia and things can't change instantaneously. Things change slowly, let's say, slowly relative to the sample rate. Or maybe they change very quickly relative to the sample rate, but they do so in a predictable fashion or a more or less predictable fashion. So in those cases, we can do much better if we take account of that knowledge, that prior knowledge that we have about the process. Could, could you say something about what you're modeling being continuous or a continuous function? Like your, I mean, your foot is, you know, all the variables are continuous. Yeah. But you're, you know, you're sampling it. Good. Sure. Hopefully this will work. So um, the key equation for, that we're going to be using is essentially this. And in most cases, we're going to have additive noise. So the equation that we've got uh, is uh, the equation we're going to rely on the most frequently is this one. And in this case, um, when you think about continuous, we're operating in discrete time, not in continuous time. You could create an analogous continuous time process, although that gets tricky because then you end up talking about burning motion and what exactly is a random process if it's continuous and it can't change instantaneously. But we'll nicely sidestep those issues by looking at a discrete time process. And so if you talk about how quickly can it change, well, uh, it depends on the sample duration, and it depends on what you mean by a lot. So x at time n plus 1, uh, oftentimes we'll use a, um, a random walk process is really common. Random walk process is that the state at time n plus 1 is equal to what it was, plus a little bit of noise. So we're essentially at each time step modeling, for example, my foot, that it moves uh, by some amount. And the amount by which it moves, it, it turns out, is controlled by the variance of this noise, which is a knob. That's part of how we specify the model. model. And, uh, and it's a user-specified parameter, unless you have some way of taking measurements and estimating this directly from some other knowledge. But oftentimes, you don't have that. I've got no statistical model for my foot or for the shoulder joints, and so in that case, what, the way we control how quickly things can change <coughs> is by specifying a large or small variance for the noise, so that represents how quickly it can move. And this, it turns out, is going to be probably the most common um, model for how the state changes over time that takes into account how quickly things can change and lets us sort of represent inertia. There's, there's more elaborate ways of doing this, but at root, that'll be the most common model. Does that help? Is it common to also specify how quickly U of N can change and kind of like acceleration going a layer deeper? Oh, yeah, good. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and we do that. You can do it both with acceleration, and it's much easier, it turns out, with particle filters. You say, well, rather than specifying it this way, I don't know what X of N plus 1 is going to be, but it's not going to move by any more than let's say, 10 centimeters, um, in which case you've actually got a uniform distribution. I don't know where it is. It's anywhere within plus or minus 5 centimeters um, and not outside that, and it's not a Gaussian distribution. And you can represent that really nicely with particle filters. It's harder with some of the other filters that we're going to be talking about. Um, but you can certainly put those constraints in. Um, I know a lot of you are working with ships and submarines and other things that are moving at sea, that tend to move at more or less a fixed rate, or their speed doesn't change very much, for a given heading, but the heading can change quite rapidly. And you can represent a model using sort of the equivalent of um, a radial coordinate system, whereas rather than representing the state in sort of Cartesian xy coordinates, you can do it in terms of how quickly the velocity changes and how quickly the heading changes. There's lots of different ways of, of representing how objects move over over time. Yeah, good. So, um, to give you a sense of how this works, let me talk um, briefly about maximum likelihood estimation, which we're not going to use, but is used very frequently. 
In this case, we've got a very simple model where our measurement y is equal to the thing we're interested in estimating. Let's call it just the state x plus some noise. And in this case, the state is, um, is deterministic. It's not random. But the noise is random. And it comes from a normal distribution with some variance sigma squared. And so y is a random variable, x is some unknown constant that we're trying to estimate, and b is the random noise that's added to x to give us y. And uh, if we only have a single observation, I, I should back up and say a word about notation. I will try, I don't promise I'm going to succeed at this, but I will try to represent random variables in bold and non-random variables in normal things. So the reason that y and b are bold is because they're both random variables, whereas x is not a random variable in this example, but it's not, it's just not known. It's an unknown constant that we're trying to estimate. So we get a single observation. And we're told y, okay, y is equal to 5. And the question comes up, what's your best estimate of x? And um, a good estimate of x in this particular example is simple enough that we can intuitively say, well, the noise that's being added has zero mean, and so whatever y ends up being, just estimate x as being equal to y. And so sort of an intuitive estimator is that x hat is equal to what your, whatever it is you observe, whatever it is that you measure. And if we look at the PDF of y uh, for a given but unknown x, we end up with this normal distribution. Uh, of y minus x, where x is essentially the mean of, of the distribution. And this function here <coughs> can be looked at from two different ways. Um, if you took a probability and statistics class, I think I can look that up. Yeah, good. So if you took a probability and statistics, statistics class, you were taught that this is a... Um, x is known, and this is a function of y. But you can look at that from the other point of view and say, I just took a measurement, and y is 7. And what I'm interested in is x. x is what I want to estimate. I don't know what it is. And when you look at this from the standpoint where y is given, and x is the unknown, x is the variable, then it's called a likelihood function. It's the same function. It's just a difference in how you look at it, and what you treat as known, and what you treat as unknown. You treat it as though x is known, and it's a function of y, it's a, a probability function. If it's the other way around, where y is given and x is unknown, then it's called a likelihood function. And a very common estimator um, uh, throughout statistics and, uh, and signal processing is to simply maximize this across all possible values of x, in which case it's called the maximum likelihood estimator. And that has a lot of nice optimal properties. There's a lot of good reasons to use that as your estimator. This shows a plot of the likelihood function for two different values of the variance of the noise. So in this case, we've got a, an observation of y is equal to 3 and sigma is equal to 1 third, and this is the likelihood function. And this is interpreted as saying it's very unlikely that x is equal to 1, and it's very likely that x is around 3. So you can interpret it much like you would a probability function. And if the variance is much broader, then there's a much wider range. You've got a lot less certainty about your estimate. So it does provide a measure of the certainty of your estimate as well as the, uh, the estimate itself. Um, as I mentioned, this has a lot of nice properties. Uh, it's optimal in certain senses. And, uh, and this can be shown to be the estimator that also minimizes the mean squared error um, in this example. But what it fails to do is that if we have prior knowledge, it doesn't have any way of incorporating that. If I now say, well, okay, same model, exactly the same model, but um, I know that x is no smaller than x min and no bigger than x max. It's within this range. How do you incorporate that? Can you improve your estimator with that knowledge? Of course you can, but how do you do it? And within the maximum likelihood framework, you don't have a way of doing it. 
you could <coughs> uh, simply say, well, I'm going to create my estimator, and if I get a value that's outside this range, then I'm simply going to shift it to that range. But that's not optimal. That's heuristic. That's, a, that's sort of a, a hack. And there's a much more elegant, optimal way uh, to do this than to simply snap it so that it's within the range where, where you know it is. So this would be sort of the, the natural estimator is to say, well, if it's less than x-min, snap it to x-min. But then what you end up doing is having a lot of values are estimated at x-min and x-max, and, and they're not uh, in any sense optimal. That's a reasonable thing to do. It's not an optimal thing to do. As, as graduate students from Portland State University, I hope you don't do this. Uh, there's a better way. I've already covered these points. One way of representing this knowledge is to say, well, I'm going to treat x as a random variable, and the prior knowledge I have is that it's got a uniform distribution within this range. I don't know that it's going to be closer, more frequently at the midpoint, or more frequently to one side than the other, I have no other information other than knowing that it's within this range, you could say, well, I'm going to model that as so though I've got prior knowledge, a prior distribution in X, so that it's constrained to being within those, within those limits. So uniform distribution over that range. And um, again, now we're modeling the thing that we're trying to estimate as a random variable. And this is a big difference between the Bayesian approach and the classical approach rather than treating it as a fixed but unknown parameter, saying, no, it's a random variable, and I maybe have prior knowledge that I can express is a PDF about x. And with that, you can do um, a lot better uh, than you can without it, especially in certain contexts. Um, we've gotten long enough, I think. I think, I think we should probably cut it off there. I know a lot of you must be saturated by now. And again, I hope during each lecture that we'll actually start off with a presentation from one of you that will hopefully help all of us have a longer attention span. It's far easier for me giving the lecture than it is for you receiving it. I know I've been on that side many, many times. Um, so I think that'll help. Um, so we'll have one more lecture like this on Wednesday, and then next Monday um, will be your turn. So have a look at the homework assignment, have a look at the, uh, the website, and you shall have a copy of the slides probably with you uh, for the next lecture. And thanks for uh, asking me to um, hold this class. It's never happened before, and for making this run. This is, this is good for me as, as well as hopefully for you. So thank you.